Okay, so I'm trying to cook and eat and talk and everything all at the same time. Let me run and get these books I could. So, in my second part of my art history class, um, while we were learning about the Renaissance, I was really drawn to um, the little excerpt that we got about Erasmus. Um, and so, I wanted to read up on you know, his life, his his publications, his art, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I wrote down two of the publications that were mentioned in the book that I was reading. And uh, I'm probably going to have to do this. Uh, in the book that I was reading, um, and I actually just recently got this book. This book came um, on Sunday. But I want to kind of just allow myself to review what it is that I've just read. Um, basically, the first couple of pieces of this book um, are focusing, focusing on his early life or, you know, his timeline of life. And then it goes into a specific letter that he wrote to a guy who was, um, who he studied up under, named Thomas More. And we realized that Erasmus um lived a life that is no different than anybody else's it had its traumas it had its tragedies it had its tragic moments but what i'm starting to learn is that the more hurdles and hardships that a person has to overcome they usually are going to find themselves dedicated to uh the arts whether it be through writing or drawing, illustration, speaking, whatever, you know. Um, and Erasmus is a very smart guy, um, very musically inclined. He was in choir when he was young. His parents died when they were about 40 uh, due to the plague that was going on during that time. Um, I believe in Rotterdam. So might have been Rome. I'm not really sure. Can't really remember off the top of my head. But he basically is born in Rotterdam, and then he moves to Rome. He spends some time in Rome, and that's where he gets his education. And then he then moves to England, or he spends some time in English culture, and is very intrigued by the beauty of the women there. And then, <laughs> and then he eventually is going to end up in France, right? Um, and I knew this because of my study. Um, he's eventually going to end up in France. And that's where we're going to see um, his contribution to the Renaissance because the Renaissance essentially started in France and made his way to, I believe, Europe. Don't get me wrong. I'm not 100% sure. I'm still learning. Um, but nonetheless, he had the majority of his fame. He was more infamous in Rome um, due to the works that he did in France. I believe he was in Beligma, Beligna. Uh, a couple of different places, but I don't want to get too um, archaeology, archaeological. I don't want to get too caught up in locations and things of that nature. I want to really remind myself of what I read about this story. Nonetheless, um, he actually ended up dying from, uh, he had gout and then he was cured from that, but he ended up dying from something else. I can't remember, but the last moments of his, his life, he spent a considerable amount of time, you know, fighting whatever that disease was. Um, I have it in here. But like I said, I don't want to get too caught up in specifics because I don't have much time here. Um, but nonetheless, um, he seemed to have lived a life that was very, you know, balanced. Um, even though there was tragedy, he had a lot of triumph because he chose to do what he thought was right for himself. Um, a lot of people wanted him to be, um, which is funny now that I say this out loud, a lot of his family members and things wanted him to be in the theological profession. They wanted him to be a part of, you know, theological study and things of that nature. And even though he could do it and he was very intelligent and he was very genius and a lot of things, he basically told them he didn't want to do that. But just because of the way life works and the way that God has a will for you, um, 
he actually ended up by accident <laughs> uh, coming in contact with some people of the church and he spent a lot of his time there learning and they did him wrong and didn't pay him and all kinds of stuff like that, which is no different than the church these days. You know, you go somewhere, do it for the church, do it for the Lord. No, pay me. I'm Yes, I'm doing it for the church and I'm doing it for the Lord. But if this is my profession, you need to pay me. Nonetheless, um, he seemed to have been a man of, you know, respect. It didn't mention he had any children or anything, but he was very dedicated to his passions and his learning and his theology and the church. It says he never steered away from what he believed uh, as far as his faith. And um, you get all of that background history. And I think it's well ordered um, to know that about him first because then, you know, in this particular book, which it's a little, it's a little funny to read because it's translated from Latin language um, of like the 14th to 15th century. And so whoever translated it did the best that they could, but you know, you gotta kind of take your time with it. I say that about all literature. You can appreciate literature if you're willing to spend some time with it and have like an intimate study with it. But nonetheless, um, we get to see a letter he wrote to Thomas More, you know, translated. And basically what he's explaining to this guy, like I said, I think I mentioned it, Thomas More is somebody who he spent some time studying under. What he's basically explaining to Thomas More is this. Um, it, it seems as if Thomas More is not very fond of some work that he put out. He feels like the work that Erasmus did was rather rude. Um, and what Erasmus is calling a diversion um, from the typical way that comedy is done. Um, and basically saying at the end of the day, you know, I thought of all people, you would appreciate this. Not just because I'm Erasmus, but because I've had conversation with you and you seem to understand my sense of humor. You seem to understand, you know, where I'm coming from. But, you know, this publication comes out and people are being highly critical of it. And you seem to be standing with the people more than you're standing with me, right? Um, and tr listen, I feel Erasmus on this because just to give a, a real life, some real life context here, I remember I had this manager um, and when it was just him and I, oh, he would laugh it up and talk it up and this is that and the other, had me really feeling like he understood where I was coming from. And I was, I was wise enough to know, you know, hey, no, we can't have these conversations, you know, in front of people, you know what I'm saying, like in front of the team and stuff like this. But I have gathered from our one-on-one -on -one conversations that he understood me enough to respect where I come from with things. But when he got in front of other people, when he got in front of like other managers and things of that nature, his, his whole demeanor and stuff would change. And so uh, long story short, I really don't did, ended up not liking him in the end because I didn't like how fake he was being, right? I understand, you know, that we can't be, you know, how we be one-on-one, -on -one, but, like, don't try to treat me like you don't understand where I'm coming from and stuff like that when we get in front of a collective group of people because you saying the same stuff that I'm saying and hi hi and kick in with me behind the scenes. So I feel a rassist where he coming from. He like, say, Thomas, you know, it is what it is, bro. Like, <laughs> I, I, I just thought you was a different type of man, but it seems like, you are no different than the same people who are critiquing and, 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 you know, criticizing me for what I've done. But Erasmus has done at this time, and he doesn't even realize it, I believe, is he has created this lane of not necessarily satirical, not necessarily folly, not necessarily comedy, but what today is considered like political comic, uh, politi political uh, cartoon, right? He, he's done this. And so... He's basically talking in this letter. It's so good. That's why I'm so excited talking about it. <laughs> he's talking in this letter to Thomas More, and he's basically saying, like, let, let's not act like talking about what's going on in a lighthearted, you know, a jocular way is not, it's something that has never been done before. He spends, you know, a considerable amount of time in the letter giving all of these examples of comedic works that have been marveled during his time that were done before his time. And you know, it's so funny because that's literally how we ingest art, right? 
We love to look at what was done in the past because we're cowards, right? Most people are cowardice. They are ready to rally up and say, man, I'm so inspired by, let's use Erasmus as an example, right? Let's say you wanted to go into political cartoons. And a person that may be interested in doing that type of art may say, man, I really love how Erasmus just stuck his foot out there and did it regardless of how people felt and defined his art and defended his art and didn't let anybody, you know, make him feel right or wrong about it. He just done it. He done what, what he had even references in the book, you know, riding his hobby horse, you know. I did what I what I enjoyed doing. I didn't let anybody stop me from doing what I felt like I needed to put out there. And we we today would look at Erasmus and be like, oh, what a great work of art in praise of folly. Oh, what a great blah, 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 blah. But then we'll criticize somebody who comes out and emerges and kind of creates a new lane and does something different and maybe does something that has already been done but puts a little bit more umph on it. And then we'll be like, oh my gosh, why would you do something like that? That's so rude. That's so, why would you say that about the president? Why would you say that about a king? And that's basically what Erasmus is saying in this book. He's like, man, let's, let's not treat this as if there have not been great writers, great artists, artists in the past who have done satirical, uh, you know, satirical work and comedy work. You know, it was now a name for it. By the time Erasmus came around, it was a name for it. But I'm sure when the artist that he was referring to did it, there was probably no name for it. And so he's like, you know, I'm not doing anything different. Like, let's let's praise what I'm doing. Because, you know, um, no matter how you may perceive it, if you perceive it as being rude or you perceive it as being hilarious, or you perceive it as being comical, like, we, when did y'all get such a tender ear? Like, I'm not doing anything that y'all aren't familiar with, but what I'm doing is a little bit different. So the praise of folly is me just asking y'all to put your bourgeoisie aside, put your put your prudent um, agendas and your prudent ideas of things aside and just enjoy this for what it is. Because let's keep it real, right? We can go into corporate spaces. We can go into uh, political spaces. We can go into sociology places or, you know, what, what would you call it? Societal places. Uh, places that require a certain type of agenda and a certain type of look and a certain type of uniform and we can respect that all day long and we do but we can't sit here and act like when we take off the blazers and take off the pendants and take down our hair and take off the makeup and come out of costume and uniform to represent you know whatever organization or thought or era that we're trying to represent we can't act like we don't have opinions that say man that was some bs like come on now like you know but we took it in stride and we did what we had to do because we stay professional like people are always going to need a place to outlet to say how they really feel and that's basically what erasmus is saying to thomas moore he's like you know i already know that the church is going to feel some type of way because you know they got to stick up their butt and you know that's no disrespect to god but you know the church people man and what they actually make the church out to be it it has become something <laughs> that god probably is looking at it like i never told y'all that that's what this was in the first place so i don't know why y'all playing with me anyway but you know that's basically what erasmus is saying like you know um yes i did something different and yes i might have hit the load of belt <laughs> more than i should have and yes i might have done some things or said some things or represented some people um in a way that they don't like but oftentimes people who have power and people who sit in positions uh, they they lack a lot of humbleness they lack a lot of self-awareness they don't see themselves as who they truly are they see themselves as the title as the position they remove themselves from human because we as humans or we we as society people of society we have given them the okay to do that you know with or without like an actual word of saying like yes you are better than us we give them that idea and it goes to their head and you know when somebody actually shows them who they really are uh because they're not able to i'll say it this way when a person uses an avenue to exaggerate and animate certain qualities of people in power or you know people who run the show or people who got titles when they do it in a way that actually gets their attention then it makes a lot of people mad. More specifically, 
it makes the subject upset because I probably have been trying to show you who you were this entire time, but because you've been so on your hot horse thinking that you better than man, um, you wasn't trying to hear it. You weren't trying to respond to it. So that's why I'm going to put your head on the body of a donkey <laughs> and I'm going <laughs> to do all kinds of what you would consider rude things to get you to see you know, who you really are and how you're really affecting the time and things of that nature. And so Erasmus goes on to basically say, you know, y'all give the people who have comedic wit and comedic satire so much respect, but God forbid, you know, we make a little bit more of a joke. We, we, we go a little bit deeper than the surface with our joking. Now it's a problem. And that's fine. That's basically the tone that Erasmus had. Y'all got the right to feel that way, bro. Uh, but I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And I'm well aware that I am open to criticism and I'm not above criticism. And so say however y'all, say whatever y'all need to say. Feel however y'all need to feel. But you, Thomas Moore, <laughs> I didn't think that I would have to say such things to you. And he basically ends it by saying, you know, if there's anybody who could speak up and be honest in the moment, it would be you. Not just because you know me or because we've had intimate conversations or because we've had moments to really fraternize, but because in my conversations with you, I really kind of drew inspiration from them conversations. And you understand where I'm coming from in this. And so I put the responsibility on you to defend this, right? Because your word could change the trajectory of the highly critical uh, feedback that I'm getting from this. Because it's not that necessarily that people are offended. People are just following the, um, the prudent style of the people that I'm talking about in this. Like, you know, we've had way worse comedy. We've, we've studied way worse comedy. We've seen people in times past who came before us call folks out and call them by name and, you know, flat out disrespect. Um, so let's not sit here and act like this is something that I've done that's new. You know, people aren't really taking the time to really allow themselves to enjoy this because they're too busy trying to follow the mood and opinion of the people of power. And honestly, it's the people of power who's causing the problems. If you know about what's going on in this time, you know that the Catholic reform is going on and the Protestant movement is happening. And they're basically calling out, you know, the, the corruption in the Catholic church. And, um, oops. And Erasmus is basically, you know, talking about that. And he's like, you know, yeah, they're going to have their opinions about it because they don't think they're wrong. They think they're above the people. And they're not. And um, he's basically telling Thomas Moore, be ethical in this situation. And stop acting like these people. When I know you to be better than that. And if you can remove your need to be a part of the commonality then your word your influence your opinion about this could change the way that this is being received and whether you do or you don't it doesn't matter <laughs> i'm gonna leave it as is because this is my work and this is how i feel and i have the right to publish my own work i know that it's going to be criticized I know that I'm going to be criticized. I've criticized other people's work. So I am no different. People are allowed to criticize my work. But you, sir, you, sir, you need to quit acting funny. You need to quit acting like you don't understand <laughs> what I was trying to, to grapple at here. And you need to um, be true to yourself. You need to be real to yourself. Don't ha ha kiki with me in private. And then completely tear me apart in public because you want to be a part of the trend. Nah, I'll keep that same energy, bro. And I just thought that that was so good. That's as far as I got this morning. Uh, but yeah.
I just wanted to come and dump that information before I move on with the book. Really good read, though, if I do say so myself. All right. Bye-bye.